Hello, today we're going to be talking about basic vocabulary that we use to describe dental anatomy. That way next time when we talk about individual teeth, um, we know what words or terms to use to describe the teeth. And so today we're going to go over very quickly tooth numbering and surfaces. Then we're going to divide teeth into thirds and with those thirds we're going to be able to describe contact points, embrasures, and heights of contours. So I don't want to dwell on tooth numbering and surfaces too much because this was covered in oral physiology, but I'm just going to go over real quick um, as a quick recap. So permanent human dentition has 32 teeth. Um, you're going to have 16 in the maxilla and 16 in the mandible. And it's divided into four quadrants with eight teeth in each quadrant. And so what the universal numbering system is, you get you, each tooth gets one number. Um, you're going to start on the upper left right here is number one. It's going to go over to 16. And then number 17 for the lower left, over to the lower right, 32. And so for people who aren't used to the universal numbering system, I think the easiest way to remember it is to just first commit to memory um, the first and the last tooth in each quadrant. So if you start 1 to 16, are going to be the first and the last tooth. And then your centrals here are going to be 8 and 9, because you have 8 teeth in each quadrant, right? And if you move on to the mandible, first and last tooth, it's going to be... 32, 17, and then the mandibular centrals are going to be 24 and 25. So now you already covered up a lot of ground area. Now the only problem is if I were to ask you what is the number for the upper left second premolar, this tooth right here is kind of far away from number 9 and it's kind of far away from 16 too. So when you're not used to it and then you're on the spot, it's difficult to quickly calculate what number that is. So it's also good to remember what the canines are. And that's going to be 6, 11, 22, and 27. So now if I ask you what's the number for the upper left second premolar, boom, it's 2 away from number 11, you know it's 13. So until you get used to, uh, until it's second nature, what um, tooth belongs to what number, um, just remembering these numbers will give you a quick way to calculate um, the number that you need for the tooth. So moving on to surfaces, when people talk about interproximal um, surfaces or the proximal surfaces, they're talking about the mesial and the distal contacts, or the surfaces, sorry. And mesial refers to the surface that's closest to the midline. So for number 13, I'd be right here, this would be the mesial surface because it's closest to the midline as opposed to the distal, which is a surface that's further away from the midline, and that's going to be right here. That's going to be your distal. Uh, next, we're going to have the buccal or facial, and also lingual and the palatal. So buccal refers to the buccinator, so it's a surface that's closest to the cheek. And it's, that refers to posterior teeth. So if I were to talk about 15 right here, the buccal surface is going to be right here. And facial is the same thing except it's for anterior teeth. And then lingual and palatal. So lingual refers to the surface that's closest to the tongue. Um, so And it's for mandibular teeth, whereas palatal is for the palate and it's going to be for maxillary teeth. But essentially the same thing or analogous to each other. And so for number 15, the palatal surface would be right here. And then lastly, we have the um, biting surfaces. So that's going to be the occlusal or the incisal surface. And so occlusal refers to the biting surface for posterior teeth. So that's going to be this right here. And then for anterior teeth is going to be the incisal surfaces, so that's going to be this right over here. So that's going to be tooth numbering and surfaces. So teeth are divided into thirds, that way when we start talking about things like contact points, um, we can accurately describe where the contact point is, or at least more, more accurately. So the way it works is we divide the crown and the root separately. So we'll start off with the root because it's easier. So the terminology is actually pretty simple. So the third that contains the apex of the root is going to be the apical third. The middle one is going to be the middle third. And the part closest to the CEJ is going to be the cervical third. And now when we divide the crown, it's pretty similar. 
Um, the part close to the CJ is going to be a cervical. The part in the middle is going to be the middle third. And the part that contains the occlusal surface is going to be the occlusal third. Now that you have to remember that a tooth is 3D, so you can divide the tooth into thirds in several different ways. Um, so we can also divide it this way. So the middle is always going to be the middle third. But now we have to figure out, is this going to be the buccal lingual or is this going to be mesial distal? And I kind of gave it away because we're looking at it buccally, so right here is the buccal surface. So that means this has to be either mesial or distal. I would highly recommend that you get a type of dot now or a 3D model or image of a tooth that you can orient to exactly what we're looking at. But right now what we're looking at is a mandibular first molar. If you kind of just tore away the cheek, we'd be looking at the buccal surface right here. So on the other side is going to be the lingual surface. And so that means this side is going to be the distal and this is going to be the mesial. And the, way, the reason I know that this is distal is because the roots point usually, for most teeth, the roots point distally. Um, so that means this side is going to be the mesial. So now when we, if we rotate this 90 degrees, so now we're looking at the mesial view, um, the root's not going to change, right? If we divide the root into thirds, there's still going to be the apical, there's still going to be the middle, and there's still going to be the cervical. Same thing, if you divide the crown this way, there's still going to be occlusal, there's still going to be middle, and still going to be cervical. Now the difference is, because we're looking at the mesial view, when we divide it this way, this is going to be middle, and now this is either going to be lingual, or it's going to be buccal. And this is going to be lingual, and this side is going to be the buccal. And the reason I know that is, A, in terms of anatomy, the mandibular first molar has a larger lingual cusp. And B, I know that because if we're looking at this way and we turn it 90 degrees for the mesial, the buckle is going to go to your left side, right? So don't worry too much about where the, like, whether it's going to lingual or buckle. What you should get out of it is the fact that you can divide the crown into thirds in three different ways. One that contains the occlusal cervical view, one that has the distal mesial, and one that has the buccal lingual. Um, so we could do the same thing with anterior teeth. I'm just going to go through quickly. Um, not much changes. The apical is still going to be the, ape, uh, the apex, is still going to be apical. It's still going to be the middle third, and it's still going to be the cervical third because it's close to the CEJ. Now when we divide the this way, same thing, there's gonna, still going to be the cervical because it's close to the CEJ. There's still the middle because close to the, it's in the middle. The only difference between this and a posterior teeth is now this contains the incisal surface. So this is going to be the incisal third. So again, other than the fact that you're switching incisal with um, occlusal, it's pretty much the same. Um, so that means you can divide it this way too. And the maxillary central is a lot easier to figure out which side is mesial, which side is lingual, versus which side is um, facial, sorry, which side is mesial distal and which side is facial lingual. And it's pretty obvious that um, we're looking at it head on in a facial lingual view. I mean, if we were to draw another tooth right here, right, that would be the other central. So right here is going the maxillary right central and we're looking at the facial view of it. So this surface right here is the facial surface. That means this side right here is going to be the mesial and this is going to be the distal. Right, this is the midline, so this is the mesial, this is distal, and of course this is going to be the middle. Now, same thing, rotate this 90 degrees now when we divide it this way, this is going to be your lingual, this is going to be the middle, and this is going to be your facial. Right, you just turn this 90 degrees. The reason that we divide teeth into thirds is that way when we talk about things like contact points, we can describe accurately where they are, or more precisely, should I say. So what a contact point is, 
This is where the mesial surface of one tooth touches the distal surface of the adjacent tooth. Or in the case of central, it's going to be the mesial surface of one central touching the mesial surface of the other central. So, example right here, this is the distal surface of the maxillary central, right? And the contact point is where the distal surface is touching the mesial surface of the lateral. Or in the case of the centrals, you're going to have the mesial surface touching the mesial surface of the other. Now right now we're looking at this from a facial lingual view, right? This is the facial surface, and the axis that you can see is going to be the incisal to the gingival axis. Um, if you contrast that with the occlusal view, where now the axis is going to be the buccal lingual axis. Do you see what I mean? Right here, the bottom here is the incisal, and the top is going to be the gingival or the cervical. So this is going to be the incisal gingival contact point. Whereas this side, the top is the buccal and the bottom is the lingual, so this is going to be a buccal lingual contact point. So when we talk about individual teeth, every tooth is going to have a mesial incisal gingival contact point, a distal incisal gingival contact point, a mesial buccal lingual or facial lingual contact point, and a distal buccal lingual contact point. Now, because anterior teeth are much thinner, um, buccal lingually or facial lingually, um, buccal lingual contact points are going to be much more prominent in posterior teeth. So some rules of contact points. So the distal incisal gingival contact point is either the same level or more gingival than the mesial incisal gingival contact point. And I believe this is just for anterior teeth. So what does that mean? So when you look at the distal contact point, right, for the maxillary central, this is slightly more gingival than the mesial contact, it's slightly higher. And the trend moves, it continues. As you go to the lateral incisor, right, the distal contact point here is more gingival or closer to the gingiva or than the mesial surface. And because of that, as you move distally, you're going to, the diag, the line is diagonal, pointing and getting closer to the gingiva. The other way to put it is as you go mesially, it's going to be more incisal. So, right, so you start distal, and then as you move mesially, now you're getting closer to the incisal edge. Um, next rule, we're just, we'll skip this for now, but the next rule is going to be all teeth have a facial lingual or buccal lingual, if you're talking about posterior teeth, contact point in the middle third of the crown, but posterior teeth have contact points leaning toward the facial. So, so this facial or buccal, same thing. Um, what that means is now when we look at this buccal lingually, right, the buccal lingual axis, if you divide the teeth into thirds here, the contact points are always in the middle thirds. And that's pretty much what it's saying. No matter for all teeth, the buccal lingual contact point is going to be in the middle third, so that's going to be easy to remember. So what you mostly are going to um, be remembering when you talk about contact points is going to be the mesial and distal incisal gingival, incisal gingival contact points. So the final rule that we have here is that all posterior incisal gingival contact points are in the middle third of the crown except the mesial surface of all molars. And that's going to be the junction of the occlusal in the middle thirds. Um, so that's just something you're going to have to remember for boards. Um, make sure you remember the exceptions because that's usually what the boards are going to test on. But um, for now, don't dwell too much on the rules. Mostly just realize what is a contact point because when we talk about individual teeth, we're going to be talking about the contact points for all the teeth. So just an example, let's talk about the left maxillary central right here. Um, if we were to divide this tooth into thirds, Um, remember, this is going to be the cervical third, this is the middle third, and this is the incisal third. If we were to describe the incisal, incisal gingival contact points, we would say that the mesial incisal gingival contact point is in the incisal third, whereas the distal incisal gingival contact point is, going in, the, is in the junction between the incisal and the middle thirds, right? So th by the junction, it just means where the two thirds intersect. So we're just going to be pretty much, when we talk about all the teeth, we're going to be talking about the mesial and distal and sagittal gingival contact points for those particular teeth. So moving on, embrasures. So what embrasure is, is a V-shaped flare surrounding proximal contact areas of a tooth. 
So what that means is everywhere that you have a contact point, like right here, you're going to have this V shape right here. As you can see, each of those are embrasures. So there are different types of embrasures. So right here we have an incisal embrasure because it's the V shape formed at the incisal edge. And here we have a cervical or gingival embrasure. Um, but you don't typically talk about that one as much because if you remember, normally you have your interdental pillar right here. Um, so unless you have like a lot of gum recession, you're not going to see your um, gingival or cervical embrasure as much. Um, and then remember the tooth is 3D, so we can look at it facial lingually. You can also look at it um, occlusally or incisally, right? So right here we're going to have a facial or lingual abrasure right here and for posterior teeth it's going to be the buccal embrasure and lingual embrasure here so we have a incisal embrasure and a facial or buccal embrasure and then a lingual embrasure and so what an embrasure is is it's a spillway for food during mastication so what happens when you chew is um, food can actually move through the embrasures and what that's going to do is it's going to reduce the pressure of mastication because now you have um, a place for food to escape and what it also does is it self cleanses the tooth because now when the food is moving through the embrasure um, it's preventing the accumulation of plaque and stuff like that and what they've noticed is when you actually shave down the con uh, the incisal surface so you no longer have an abrasure what happens is food gets forced through the contact point and what that's going to do is it's going to irritate the interdental papilla right here and it can actually cause gingivitis or in, um, periodontitis so the rule to remember for embrasures is that facial embrasures are always thinner than lingual embrasures um, and the exceptions to that are the mandibular centrals where the facial embrasure is the same as the lingual embrasure and the maxillary first molar where the facial embrasure is greater than the lingual embrasure. So what that means is uh, these, aren't gonna, these aren't very good pictures but pretty much what it means is normally the facial embrasure here is always going to be thinner than the lingual embrasure and by thinner it means like the V is going to be skinnier so it's going to be like a skinny V versus a fat V and so when the exceptions are mandibular centrals so mandibular centrals um, if you pretend this is a mandibular central the facial is going to be the angle here is going to be the same as the lingual side and then for maxillary molar uh, the buccal embrasure is going to be greater than the lingual embrasure the angle right here so those are the two exceptions for the embrasures. Again, don't get too bogged down in the rules. Just make sure you know what an embrasure are and that the, you have um, both incisal, facial buckle, and lingual embrasures. And then later when you study individual teeth, you'll learn a little bit more about the embrasures of individual teeth. So last but not least, we have heights of contour. So what a height of contour, it's also known as a height of curvature, and so what it basically is, it's an imaginary line that encircles the tooth or the tooth surface at its greatest bulge. So pretty much, if you go back to the mesial view of the mandibular first molar, if you look at the buccal view here, right, this is the buccal and this is the lingual, we have a lingual cusp right here. Um, the height of contour on the buccal side would be this right here. And the height of contour on the lingual side would be just about this part right here. So pretty much it's just where the greatest bulge is. So facial or buccal height of contours, the rule is it's going to be in the cervical third for all teeth, except mandibular molars. And those are going to be in the junction of the cervical and middle third. And then for lingual heights of contour, anterior teeth is going to be in the cervical third. So Pretty much for anterior teeth, both the facial and the lingual height of contour is going to be the cervical third, so that's going to be easy to remember. Posterior teeth is going to be in the middle third, except for the mandibular second premolar, and that's going to be the occlusal third. So remember, we can divide this tooth into thirds. So if we divide it this way, right, this is your occlusal, this is your middle, and that's your cervical. Now the buccal. Um, height of contour is going to be the junction of the middle and cervical third and a lingual height of contour is going to be in the middle third 
and does that. Yeah, so you see that follows the rules, right? So the buccal head of contour for mandibular molars is in the junction of the cervical and middle third, which is this right here. And the lingual head of contour is in the middle third, and that's right here in the middle third. So um, in terms of function of the height of contour, so there has been some debate of what it actually does. So originally it was thought that um, because you have a bulge, now you have um, a space for um, food to move through, similar to an embrasure, and so they thought that that would um, help self-cleansing and stuff like that. But they found that if you actually shave away the heights of contour so you don't have that anatomy anymore, um, it doesn't really do that much for um, self-cleansing. Um, so the, the actual functionality of the height of contour has some debate to it. But in terms of what they are, you just need to know it's the greatest bulge, and you just have to be able to describe where it is on every single tooth. So that's going to be the end of our lecture for today. Um, so just as a recap, um, don't get too bogged down in the details and the rules of the different things that we talked about today. Um, for this, for the purpose of this lecture, uh, what you want to do is just big picture. What is a height of contour and how would you describe it? Um, what an embrasure is, and again, that you know that you have both incisal, facial, and buccal embrasures, as well as facial buccal and lingual embrasures and that contact points you're going to have the incisal gingival axis and a buccal lingual or facial lingual axis and um, you can describe where the mesial and distal contact points are using division of teeth into thirds and next time when you learn again when you learn about individual teeth you'll learn about these concepts and how they apply to each specific tooth and so we'll learn about that next time so thanks for listening